Welcome to another edition of Bill Sorsky Sports Talk Chicago, one of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So grab yourself an ice cold one and a ball of sausage, and park your keister in the French room, and listen to Bill Sorsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose, as long as the Packers lose. For everything. Welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Sean. I'm going to start this episode off with a message from our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. Hockey comes back to the BMO Saturday, October 11th. Don't miss out on any of the excitement. Get your tickets now at icehogs.com. So I'm flying solo this episode, but we should have a good episode. We're going to talk to, uh, what the Cubs have been doing, the White Sox have been doing, some finally some Blackhawks news because the season's getting ready to start, uh, a little bit of Bulls. And then we're going to preview the uh, what's been going on with the Bears this week and their upcoming game Monday night against the Jets. So sit back and take it all in. So starting off, I guess, with the Cubs, because I'm, I'm a Cubs fan. Uh, Gary's not here. Uh, he he is a hard resident White Sox guy, and uh, so I'm going to put them in the back seat as I always do when it's just me. Um so the big news is the breakout wins against uh, Cincinnati. Finally took out the brooms, swept the Cincinnati uh, Reds. That was that was really good. Uh, it was this week basically two series, one against the Reds, one against the Dodgers. Sweep, sweeping this, the, the Reds, that was a really good one. Uh, what can I say about this week is the pitching had its ups and downs. Uh, Felix Dubrant had a rough outing against uh, the Dodgers in an 8-7 loss. Uh, pitched two and a third innings, giving up six earned runs. Oof. <laughs> not not what you want to see. And uh, uh, out of your starting pitching in the bullpen, did come in and, and shut down the Dodgers, which is actually pretty hard to do with that potent offense. So it, was a, it wasn't a total bust. Um, Edwin Jackson imploded again in a game that was an interesting one. It was arguably the best best pitcher in baseball versus arguably the best the worst pitcher in baseball with Clayton Kershaw starting against Edwin Jackson and the Cubs actually got to Clayton Kershaw which is really impressive because he's been nearly untouchable and he's has to be talked about as a potential MVP candidate for the season so um you know not just Cy Young but actual MVP so Edwin Jackson pitched two-thirds of an inning against the Dodgers in that game gave up five earned runs I mean not really surprising that a potent offense and he's just a terrible pitcher coming off of an injury. So uh, you know, Dan, Dan Straley followed it up with a inning and a third with six earned runs in that same game. It just, just bad, bad pitching. But then against Cincinnati, you had, I mean, granted Cincinnati is a different echelon team as the Dodgers, but still the Cubs heavy hitters came out. Uh, Kyle Hendricks came in and dominated Cincinnati with seven in, uh, innings pitched, only one earned run. Uh, Jake Arrieta almost had a perfect game. I mean, he gave up one hit and had one walk. Barring that, he had, you know, next to him, untouchable as you could. So he had nine innings pitched, uh, one hit, one walk, 13 strikeouts, and he was just mowing him down. And that was a game that he went up. Uh, it was supposed to be a pitcher's duel because it was Jake Arrieta versus uh, Johnny Cato, or Cueto, I guess you pronounce it Cueto. Uh, Johnny Cueto and, and the Cubs really got to Cueto and, and really dominated that game, really frustrated him. So it's a that's a plus. And then even Travis Wood finally came out and had a good game after a pretty rough season for him. Uh, he had a good start against Cincinnati and uh, did six innings, uh, no earned runs. So the, the top-end guys on the pitching rotation have looked pretty good, and other than... Uh, other than Dan Straley, the, the bullpen has looked really good, too. I mean, they've looked good most of the season, especially the back end of the bullpen. Um, but what, what the Cubs' Achilles heel has been is, uh, well, I mean, this, the back end of the starting pitching has been pretty poor. Uh, still trying to figure out what they're going to do there. But the hitting has been um, inconsistent. You know, now that 
now that Starlin Castro is is hurt and not playing, uh, Anthony Rizzo is back, and he's he's been the most consistent Cubs hitter along with Jorge Soler. Those two guys are really the only cogs that have continuously spun and spun and spun and and, and produced for the Cubs. Uh, but you're getting, I mean, at least you're getting some timely hitting from other guys. Uh, you know, Rizzo's looked great after his back has uh, healed up a little bit. Um, but the, but they've been getting timely hitting, but not consistent hitting, which is not a hallmark for a long-term winning team because you need you need guys that are consistently hitting and along with timely hitting. So Coglin went four for four against the Dodgers with two home runs. That was good, and he's actually been playing pretty well as of late. I believe he's batting over two eighty now. So. He's actually been playing pretty well. I think that's going to bode well for his chances to be on, on this team next year. Um, but then you have to, you know, go with a random RBI by Valbuena here, or a random RBI by Ryan Kalish here. There's been nothing consistent, so that's a that's difficult when you have when you're trying to string together a series of wins. Is you don't know where that offense is going to be counted on. You know Rizzo's going to go up and have good at bats, and you know Soler's going to have good at bats. But uh, Arismendi Alcantara has been struggling as of late, and uh, Javi Baez is having some significant troubles. I mean, he's you know he's batting around one sixty five. Ed uh, Travis Wood is batting better than than Javi Baez, and actually I feel more comfortable putting putting Travis Wood up to bat ahead of. Uh, Javi Baez right now, and that's saying a lot. I mean, well, Travis Wood is very good at uh, batting pitcher, but still, you never want to put a pitcher over your number one prospect in your minor leagues. I guess now he's up in the majors, but excuse me. Uh, so the Cubs is it's been really inconsistent hitting, and you don't know where these runs are going to come from if they're not going to come from Rizzo or come from Solaire, and that's that was. I mean, they've been getting runs because they've swept the, they swept the Reds and they, against the Dodgers, they put up runs. They just didn't put up as many as they were scoring. So they are putting up runs. It's just been inconsistent where they're coming from, and that's, that's something that they're going to have to address in the off season is is getting more consistent in their hitting. Um, what else for the Cubs? Uh, oh, Anthony Rizzo was uh was named the uh. He won the Branch Rickey Award for um, for being a humanitarian. So uh, Rizzo is going to be inducted as the 23rd member of the Baseball Humanitarians Hall of Fame on November 14th. Um, and uh, the Branch Rickey Award was created by the Rotary Club of Denver in 1991. And it honors... Uh, baseball players who contribute unselfishly to the communities and are strong role models for young people. Each year, Major League Baseball teams are asked to nominate one team member for their award. Rizzo was chosen uh, by a national selection committee comprised of 400 members of the sports media, baseball executives, past award winners, and road, uh, district governors. Um, fans are also given somewhat of a vote in there. But Rizzo, as we all know, overcame Hodgkin's lymphoma and... Um, and he does a lot of charity work. He hosted two cook-offs for cancer, and he's raised more than $500,000 for cancer research. He's also a regular visitor to the pediatric center at the, at different hospitals around the area in both Chicago and in Florida. So that's that's a really good honor for him. He's a 25-year-old guy finally coming into his own and being recognized for not just what he's doing as a baseball player, but as a human being. That's that's really impressive. And kudos to Anthony Rizzo. I'm glad he is signed to a reasonably long-term contract and is going to be a Cub for a long time to come. Uh, and I guess some final moves is the Cubs have, have done some uh, more minor league moves and not with players, but actual teams. So... The Cubs moved their rookie ball from the Idaho to Eugene, Oregon, where they're going to be now affiliated with the Eugene Emeralds. And the Emeralds uh, ended a 14-year relationship with the San Diego Padres, so the Cubs will be moving there. And the single-A team is leaving Kane County Cougars to move to South Bend, where the, the former Silverhawks team there is going to be rebranded with a new name, new uniform, new logo, 
etc. to be affiliated with the Cubs in their single A team. And that's the low A. And the high A, they moved from the Daytona Cubs to now they're going to be uh, affiliated with the Myrtle Beach Pelicans. And you're probably wondering why, why do this? And the team has moved minor league affiliates quite a bit, but the Cubs moves were all, had, they, they didn't say anything, but they all have one key component is much better facilities. And that's something the Cubs have been striving for is their facility and for spring ball in Arizona, top notch facility. Uh, their their uh, training camp in the Dominican, top notch facility. Moving their rookie ball, low A, high um, high A, to facilities that have new stadiums and or upgraded stadiums and modern facilities. These are all things the Cubs are trying to do. Uh, they also extended to through 2018 their relationship with the Iowa Cubs. So they're trying from the ground up, really build a new program, new players, new attitude, new facilities that these guys can train in and play in. And the last component is actually the worst facility is the major league one with the, the Wrigley Field. And, and they, they're they already beginning their renovations there. So it's a, this is going to be a completely new organization within a couple of years. It's you know going to be unrecognizable. Winning, it's going to have a winning team with hitting and pitching and minor league system and modern facilities. It's, it's not your grandfather's Cubs anymore. So this is all exciting times. And, and to consider that the Cubs have, after this season, are going to have like a forty-five million dollar payroll. They have a lot of room to work with to be able to sign some guys. Where probably next week or the week after, we're going to do a really in-depth look at the Cubs, maybe even wait till the week after the season's over, which will be soon enough anyway, uh, really break down what what the Cubs and the Sox are going to be doing in the offseason and what we expect and such. But, uh, I mean, look at look at the, the Cubs pitching. I mean, uh, Wada has been solid for the Cubs. Um, Travis Wood, other than this year, has been pretty solid. Kyle Hendricks has been playing great. Jake Arrieta is playing amazing. You add... You add a top flight and a mid-line pitching to that roster, and suddenly when instead of Jake Arrieta being your ace, he's going against the number two man, and he's a he's pitching like an ace in his own right. So you have him pitching against the number two guy, suddenly improves the Cubs' chances. You move Kyle Hendricks down to three, or even if you pick up somebody better even and move him to three or four, is you give you give the Cubs a better chance and a better chance to win all these games. So you have a top line starter like John Lester, improves your chances of winning. You moved Arietta down to two, and likely he's going to be better than the pitcher he's going against. Improves the Cubs' chances of winning. Hendricks moving down to three, again prove prove your chances, and then it starts moving some of these bottom rotation guys out and either into the bullpen, back into the minors, or out on the streets and basically improve your improve your uh, starting rotation by by adding top line starters and moving everybody down so that's that's a really promising thing with the cubs is when you look at the their top line guys have been very good you add another top line guy just makes that rotation so much better um i guess moving on to the white Sox is uh this week has been Fairly short week for them, only a few games, but uh, marred by bad starting pitching and, and poor hitting. It's, uh, it's becoming the story of the White Sox. Um, you know, Petrica had a blown save against the Royals after a solid start by Jet Danks, which is hasn't been the norm this week. Chris Sale with an uh, unseasonable poor start against Kansas City, had five innings pitch, gave up five runs. And the bullpen actually held after he left the game, gave up no more runs, or gave up one unearned run, but no earned runs. Uh, Quintana had a solid start against Tampa Bay, going seven innings, and and the bullpen held up in a win there. But um, another another poor start on against Tampa on Saturday by the starters, and uh, where the bullpen held up, and they had. Again, just like the Cubs, there's been no consistent hitting with with the White Sox. If Jose Abreu, he's been the only consistent guy, and his home run numbers have really dipped down. His, you know, average has been climbing, but 
his uh, his home run production has gone really down, and they're scoring a lot less runs. Eaton has been up and down. I mean, he's if you look at his numbers, he's he's hitting well, but not getting that timely hitting. And there's really nobody else to count on in that roster if if Jose Abreu is not clobbering the ball. So that's uh, um, you know, that's got to be frustrating for White Sox fans and. And again, just like the Cubs, they're going to have a really minimal payroll after the end of the season. I believe they're in the low 50s. So they have room to work with as well. But um, Gary would probably disagree. But I think that the Cubs probably have a lot more to work with than the White Sox do and more money to work with. The White Sox have an absolutely amazing pitcher in Chris Sale and an absolutely amazing first baseman with Jose Abreu. But other than that, I mean, you could really get rid of almost anybody else and start from front uh, start from scratch and and be able to do what you're doing so it's they've got a lot a lot to uh a lot of work to do in the south side and i wonder if uh you know they're going to be up for the challenge is because that's a it's a big challenge you know you have some guys that could potentially be good but they're really going to have to prove it and you know that's in a short time because you have Sale and Sale and Abreu are in their prime right now, so you have to be able to do it. Whereas the Cubs, they have guys that are just coming into their own, so they have they still have a season that they can work with and play with and not really lose a ton out. Um, so we're going to try to keep this to be a reasonably fast moving show. Um, so we'll have a bigger episode when after the Bears game on Monday night. So make sure to check that one out. Uh, I'm gonna break really quickly to to kind of uh, get you to go to our social media sites. So if you're on Twitter, make sure to follow us at at SwirskySports.com. That's S W E R S K I Sports.com. And if you're on Facebook, again Facebook.com/slash Swirsky Sports. Uh, like us over there. And we not only do we put the podcast episodes up so you know, but also we put uh, some news stories and some other writings that I do uh, on there. I have a breakdown of some of the plays from the Bears 49ers game where I took stills from the, the image and kind of broke down what happened, good and bad. So that's uh, definitely something to check out or go to uh, the website, SwirskySports.com, S W. E-R-S-K-I sports.com. Again, we post a lot of stuff over there. And if you ever want to get in touch with the show, uh, if you want to just email and have your question read on the air, it's Bill Swirsky, S-T-C at gmail.com. And that's also on the website. And uh, Or if you actually want to have your voice on the air, nobody wants to take advantage of this. We've gotten a few written questions, but we nobody wants to call in and on the uh, our Google Voice line. But if you want to leave a message, it'll uh, it'll ring. You can leave a message, and we can uh, we can play it on the air. But it's a eight four seven two six one four one four six. Call, leave a message, and we'll play your message on the air. So definitely take a the opportunity of that. And whether you listen to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Cast Roller or however you do it, make sure to subscribe because. We don't always have a set schedule like a lot of other shows because this isn't what I do full time and uh, I have a pregnant wife and work two jobs and um, do some other things outside of this. So I can't always get it out at the same time every week, but I do put a show out every week and if you subscribe, it'll come to you every week. Or if you follow us on the Twitter and Facebook, I post it on there as well. So make sure to check those out. And um, if you are nice enough when you're on iTunes, Give us a rating. Uh, the the more ratings we have, the the higher we go into search engines, and that's where we'll find new new people. And uh, the more people we have listening, which we have a pretty good, good number now, is uh, we can get more guests like Chicago Bears and Blackhawks players, and that that would be cool for me, and hopefully for you too. So definitely check us out, and any feedback definitely hit us up, uh, and uh, you know let's head back into the show. Moving on to the Blackhawks, uh, training camp is is open now. Uh, the first open practice at the United Center is m- tomorrow during the Bears game. 
And the first game is actually Tuesday against the Red Wings. So I'm actually going to be at both of those and have to DVR the Bears game. Eek. Uh, and so we now actually have players on the ice practicing. And from what I'm reading from players and, and beat writers is that the line of Brandon Saad, Brad Richards, and Patrick Kane has already gelled and looking amazing. And I think that's really important because I think Brandon Saad and Patrick Kane are really young, talented guys. And I think the big issue has been finding a center that, that played well with them is Michael Hansus was just too old and slow to be able to keep up with those two guys. Andrew Shaw is, he's, I love Andrew Shaw, but he's just not the, the second line talent that, that you want at center to be able to, to play with these guys. And sure, they did fantastic against the, the Kings last year, but I think this line could really be the real deal. So we'll see if uh, if they hold up and, and play like a, and play like they've been playing so far in, in training camp. Um, so, yeah, talking about Brad Richards, the offseason signing of Brad Richards likely ended Andrew Shaw's second-line opportunity. Um, but... He did have Shaw did have a successful stint and with Kane and Saad on the second line in the playoffs last season and um, he's excuse me but he's been in the NHL for nearly 200 games now in a variety of roles but mostly the third line center the question kind of comes is where where is his role going to be on this team this year um, Shaw is a pretty athletic guy. He's much more athletic than most people think. He battles for pucks. We all know that. He's he's a big disturbance around the net. He's a de- uh, he's defensively responsible. He adapts to playing different players, and uh, uh, you know he's he's just a he's just a really good team player. On the flip side, Shaw has really struggled in faceoffs. He's a really li- a real liability there. Uh, his puck handling. And his ability to carry the puck cleanly in the offensive zone aren't always so great. And his offensive game is pretty limited to mostly being around the net. And, um, you know, he can get some careless penalties. So it's a, he's a double-edged sword, if you will. And so you have to really wonder what his role on this team is going to be. I mean, I think they really like him for his tenacity and his ability to go out there and do anything and, and be a good teammate and a really coachable guy. But uh, he's he's had his chances to play as a top six role before, and and hasn't lasted too long. So I, I really I really think he's going to stick as the the third line center, and I, you know move up if if there's injuries. But I think if this team is going to go really far, I think he's just going to have to excel as the third line guy, and and see from there. Um, and. So that's what I really look for Shaw this season, and and I think that's where Quinville will utilize him the best. Also, Blackhawks are around one point three million dollars over the salary cap. They have to be under the cap by the time that training camp or by the regular season opens. So we've got a little bit more time for the Blackhawks to make a move, but they're really going to have to make a move. And if they feel that Tavo Teravainen is actually going to make the roster, which is a little bit questionable right now, is they're going to have to clear some more cap than that because he, he's going to count more than a million dollars versus the cap. So uh, right now it stands as $1.3 million. And Stan Bowman was talking about about it the other day in, in a interview, and he said that he believed the Blackhawks would be able to locate a trade in the coming weeks. Uh, his actual quote was, I think leading into training camp, most, most guys wanted to get going. Um, like I said, everyone sort of has a plan for how things go. Then a week from now, your plan might be to change because players you expected to do something don't do something. A lot of teams have high hopes for some of the young players. And then you get into games and you realize, well, they're a younger player. They're not going to be able to do what I thought they might. It's a bit of a waiting game at this point. We've had a lot of discussions over the weeks or months, but until guys get on the ice, not a lot changes from July until now. I think we'll see how that plays out plays itself out over the next couple of weeks here. Uh, there's been a number of Hawks that have been on the, the rumor trading block, and uh, Nick Letty, Johnny Oduya, even Patrick Sharp, but they've all been dismissed and by their by the team and by their representatives. And 
So you really don't know what they're going to do, but I feel like they're going to have to make a move of a guy with uh, at least a moderate salary in order to have flexibility going forward, whether you know they want to move Tavo Teravainen up or if they want to make a trade. The trade deadline, I believe, Bowman, Bowman was upset last year about not being able to make a move because of their financial restrictions. But I, I honestly think that they're really going to try to move Chris Versteeg because he was not very good last year when they brought him back. He's got a moderate salary that can move them to under the salary cap. And I think they have some young, hungry guys that would move up and, and relish the role and, and take advantage of it. So I, I honestly look for them to move Chris Versteeg if they can. Uh, the Chicago Bulls, they signed Etwan Moore, uh, former Purdue guy, a guard. They signed him last week. They're sort of filling out that that roster role. Uh, but uh, Moore, he's a, a native of East Chicago, Indiana. He signed a partially guaranteed deal as the team's 13th player. He's a six foot four, 191 pounder. Spent the last two seasons with the Orlando Magic, averaging 6.3 points, 1.4 assists in 19 minutes a game. Uh, he's widely considered to be a strong, tough player who adds character to a locker room. He spent one season with the Celtics, who drafted him uh, 55th in 2011. The Bulls opened training camp in September, uh, on September 29th, with the first set of practices being uh, September 30th. They remain in the market for a fifth big man and will add some players to be training camp bodies at the, uh, by the time they get to training camp. They also continue to monitor, monitor whether Ray Allen will play this coming season. And they have some interest there, but I don't know how much sense that makes and how much financial room they have because he's basically uh, a slightly better shooting Mike Dunleavy, but can't play any defense at all. So um, I'm not sure what that role is other than to be a guy who has winning experience that can bring to the team. Because he won with the Celtics and he won with uh, LeBron and the Miami Heat. So other than that, I don't know what else he could bring to this team that they don't already have. But basically, the roster is already set. Um, and then we could talk about Derrick Rose playing in the, uh, the the FIBA, the International Team USA Basketball Tournament. Um, championship game, four shots, four misses, but a second gold medal. I mean, his performance isn't going to rank among one of his all-time best by any stretch. Uh, zero points in a championship game. Uh, but that being said, it's a night that he's never going to forget. He's won the gold medal secured their second straight FIBA Basketball World Cup with a 129-92 route of Serbia. And he got the gold medal without scoring. And he actually said, it feels good. We came in here with a goal, and that the goal was to win a championship. We took we took one uh, one shoot around at a time, one practice at a time, one day at a time. That's the recipe for winning a championship. Uh, the former MVP basically was used sparingly during the, during the champion, or the the uh, FIBA tournament. Um, he just played 16 minutes in the final game, but he survived 50 days of playing natural basketball against uh, teammates and scrimmages and exhibitions and in actual tournament play where they went on to win a championship game. And I think that's going to be the significant role is who cares what he actually did. That's a little disappointing that he didn't score more but and play a little better, but uh, he felt his knees were... Uh, you know, held up and playing on on his knees was a significant issue during the coming season. So it's a huge relief to the training staff for the Bulls, the whole Bulls organization, Derek Rose, and even the fans. Uh, physically, he's great. So mentally, he's playing better. And he played f five games in six days. So that's a that's a good a good thing for Derek Rose. And during the tournament, he averaged four point eight points, three point one assists. And has shown glimpses of the guy he once was, but uh, we have to see. We have to see how he's going to play in the NBA once the season starts. Um, but I look at I look at this tournament as the second phase of his rehab, because the first phase was was healing it and strengthening it and getting back to a physical point for for regular people that aren't professional athletes that aren't exerting so much force on their knees. The second phase is actually going out and playing in basketball games, and so it's nice that he was able to play during the offseason in a competitive way to get to get healthy so he's not dealing with his rust issues during the season when 
the Bulls are really counting on him to help win games. So that's a uh, that's big for the Bulls, and I think it's big for Derrick Rose, and we shall see. I think this is going to ultimately make him a better Bull this year and better basketball player and closer to where he once was when he won the MVP. Finally, we'll talk about the Chicago Bears and uh, this what's been going on this week and preview Monday night game against the Jets. Big news, injury bug. Injury bug. It has hit the Bears hard. Uh, they already lost Charles Tillman for the season. Um, Jeremiah Ratliff will be out against the Jets with a concussion. Shea McClellan will be out with a broken hand. Roberto Garza still out with that ankle. Matt Slauson out with an ankle. Sherrick McMahon is out with a quad injury. Trevor Scott doubtful with a foot injury. Chris Conti is probable with a shoulder injury. Jared Allen probable with a back injury. Josh Morgan probable with a groin injury. Uh, Brandon Marshall questionable with that ankle in- injury. Alshon Jeffrey questionable with the quad or uh, with this hamstring issue. So, what does that mean for the? the Bears this week well with Jeremiah Ratliff who has been their best defensive tackle this season and not unexpectedly either is they're going to have to lean on the rookies Eagle Ferguson and Will Sutton a lot more against this Jets team and we're going to get into that a little more but that's a little bit scary based on how good the Jets are in there Uh, there's been a practice squad merry-go-round the new active practice squad is going to be has been dictated by the injuries that have been going on, so uh, they have a, a new tight end on there, Blake Annan, uh, defensive tackle Brandon Dunn, David Fails got moved from the active roster to the practice squad, and I think the they were really trying to protect him and make sure that nobody stole David Fails because I think they really do like him, but you with so many injuries you can't have you don't have the luxury of having that third wide or third corner third quarterback on your roster. They just can't do it. It's with They have to carry extra guys you know, in spots that they're already thin, in spots where they've lost people and they don't know who's going to perform. So cornerback is a spot where now that Tillman's out, you're going to be leaning on Jennings and uh, Kyle Fuller, but then who, who fills in down the road? Who fills in the new nickel spot? Who's going to fill in as the, the fourth cornerback? So once you get rid of a top guy, it's not just everybody moves up. It's the bottom end guys. It's it's who's going to shake out because you still have questions about that. So uh, you you just don't have the luxury of having a third quarterback on your active roster. And so they had to move David Fails and, and risk losing him, putting him on the practice squad. So that's he's there now. Uh, you move Ryan Groy to the practice squad, and that's because you already have limited guys that are able to play on the offensive line with Garza out and um, – uh, Matt Slauson's still out so you you have guys there that can be brought up in a moment's notice that are practicing know your game plan and such Al Lewis Jean at cornerback uh, Terrell Manning signed at linebacker likely due to some of the linebacking poor play and Shea McClellan's injury uh, Terrence Mitchell another cornerback uh, Roy Fillon defensive tackle uh, Jordan Sullen cornerback Chris Williams back in the wide receiver uh, practice squad, and they cut Greg Hurd. So that's that's where they're at. And if you just look at the, the positions, it's tight end because Bears cut Matthew Mulligan. So they only have two tight ends on their active roster, and that's Martellus Bennett, Rosario Dawson, and or, oh my God, that's the actress, uh, Dante Rosario. Uh, so Dante Rosario and Martellus Bennett. And... Uh, Sorry, I'm recording this really early. It's a Sunday morning, so I'm still a little brain fried. And uh, so they only have two tight ends on the active roster, and this is a this is a kind of a pass happy offense that you need these guys. So it's a little bit surprising they cut Matthew Mulligan because he, as we've said many times on this show, is the way the Bears did it last year is they brought in Evan Britton to be to play tight end almost, and you knew when he was out there he was never going to go out and catch a pass. He was just going to block, 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 block. And so you sort of limited your offensive play calling out of that formation. But if you have Matthew Mulligan in there, he can block almost as well as a, theoretically almost as well as an offensive lineman, but he actually poses somewhat of a threat to go out and catch a ball. So I thought that added more flexibility, but the team thought otherwise. So I don't know if he's going to be a guy they bring back 
later on in the season and they, like they did with Tony Fiametta. But uh, my feeling is they, they, they cut Mulligan to make room for Tony Fiametta and they're going to really try to get that run game going again. But um, as I said, is the tight end or the practice squad is is mostly players that are filling in roles where their their bears are very questionable with depth now. So tight end, guard, cornerback, defensive tackle, wide receiver, and not so much the best players or who have the most potential, but guys that that can actually come in and and not be uh, not be just sitting on the streets and come in cold, but guys that are actually practicing and, and learning their defense so they can come in if necessary. And I think that's a smart way to do it because they do have an injury bug. This is a long season. And, um, you know, the guys on your practice squad likely aren't ever going to be superstars. So you just want to have guys that are are ready for battle if, if need to be called at a moment's notice. And if you're just sitting at home on your couch, not on a team, it's a lot harder to do that than if you're on the practice squad. Um, Bears also signed Isaiah Fry to the active roster and Demontre Hurst to the active roster. So those are guys uh, Isaiah Fry has experience playing last year. So look for him to get more playing time. And then in sort of Bears, not Bears news, Devin Hester broke the all-time uh, returns for touchdowns record that he had tied with Deion Sanders. So he finally broke that in a punt against Lovey Smith's Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And that's really great news. We're really proud of Devin Hester, really happy for him. Uh, and he actually looked explosive in that, that offense. But the thing is, is, um, you know, a lot of fans I heard were like, why did we ever get rid of Devin Hester? Why, why, why? The problem is, is Devin Hester makes a lot of money that the bears really didn't have the the room to to pay him and on the in the bear system he only fills one spot and that's punt returner kick returner he can't go down and make a tackle on special teams he can't he's not a good wide receiver sure he had some explosive plays for the atlanta falcons but the way they run their offense is different than what the bears do and the bears run a really precise timing routes and Devin hester can't do it he absolutely can't run a precise route. It's not in him. I mean, think of all the years he's been with the Bears. And when, uh, before Trustman came in, they still had Moose and Muhammad. Moose and Muhammad was telling, you could watch him in plays, walk up to Devin Hester and walk him to where he needed to line up. And I'm sure told him where he needed to run and then would go back to his spot. Brandon Marshall was doing the same thing later on. This guy has been in the league a long time, and he's just not capable of running a route. Jay Cutler just didn't trust him as a wide receiver, and rightfully so. If you can't be at the spot you're supposed to be, you cause. Uh, and let I me mean, look at look at the way Peyton Manning reacts to his wide receivers when uh, when there's a blown pass. It's most likely is Peyton Manning is like a master of that offense, and he knows where that wide receiver is supposed to be at what time. And if he's not there. That makes Peyton Manning look bad, and it's not Peyton Manning's fault. It's the same thing with Jay Cutler on a lot of these, and I'm not taking all bad passes or interceptions away from, from Jay Cutler, but when you run a timing-type offense, you are expecting guys to be at spots when you need them to be at spots and run routes that they are supposed to be running. And if they don't, you wind up with interceptions that look really bad. Look at the one in week one with Martellus Bennett, uh, not turning around to catch that pass and just kept running is is it looked like a really bad pass by Jay Cutler but really what it was is Martellus Bennett didn't run the correct route and wasn't paying attention so that was you got a lot of that from Devin Hester so they don't want to throw to Devin Hester because he's a liability when he needs to be in a timing route so they did a lot of trickery plays end arounds and sh bubble screens and he's not a big and strong enough guy to be able to break a tackle if he needs to. So he just didn't fit the Bears system at all. And he took his shots at Jay Cutler in the post-game interviews, which was a little bit not necessary. And, um, you know, so you know Cutler didn't trust him. He couldn't run a route. He was talking bad about Jay Cutler, who's your quarterback. And you needed Musa Muhammad... Brandon Marshall to show him where he needed to line up. So 
he's just not a guy that you need. Sure, we're suffering in return game. And that's that's always painful. But the thing is, is you just can't afford to hold the roster spot when you're only allowed to have 45 active on game day and to save one for just a kick guy who stands around on the sidelines. Not not a, not what you need in the NFL season. And, you know, I'm glad he's doing well in Atlanta, uh, but I, I'm i glad he's doing well in Atlanta and not on the Chicago, not being on the Chicago Bears and holding a roster spot. On the flip side of that game is Lovey Smith. Oof. And... You know, there's a lot of people again that say Lovey Smith should still be with the Bears, and Mark Trestman went backwards, and he had less wins than Lovey did the season he got fired. Blah blah blah. Is the issue is is sort of like I always tell Gary with the Cubs when Jim Hendry uh, got fired and they brought in the new regime in in Chicago is is they took steps back to take steps forward. With the Cubs, they had to blow up that old roster of aging veterans that were making a lot of money and and weren't the same level as they were before and were getting to, ready to, to slip down even further and and a, a roster that didn't have a lot of bottom end talent it's just a few top end talents that were aging so you had to blow it all up and be able to to try to re rebuild the whole franchise and that's what the bears are doing now is uh, they had a pathetic offense they had some keys in place but Lovey is an absolute abomination when it comes to offense, and I, I don't feel he's an NFL head coach. He's great with players, but he's terrible at personnel choices. He's terrible at offensive coaching choices, and he is so hands-off of the offense, he just doesn't care. He doesn't care. He wants to run his defense. He wants to run with his guys. And that's that's just not in for... The Tampa Bay Buccaneers to basically say, "Hey, Lovey, here's the reins, and you have a lot of power to have make personnel choices." It's that's a poor choice, and that's a recipe for disaster. And I don't look for Lovey to be successful in the long term. Uh, I mean, he's really great at getting the most out of guys, and he's a guy that players love to play for. But it just that you can't win in this league without a good offense, and he is incapable of that. And it showed last night is they they gave a lot of money to Josh McCown, who's a great guy, but he's Josh McCown. You can't take a guy who's been one quarterback his whole career for a long time, and then suddenly expect him in his mid thirties to to figure it out and become a great football player. It's just not hap- that doesn't happen. He last year he was a product of Mark Trestman's quarterback friendly system. He fit that system very very well, and the Bears a wouldn't pay him the money that Tampa Bay did and couldn't pay him the money that Tampa Bay did. So he moved on. And the thing is, is you can if you have a really great system, you can find quarterbacks to fit it. If you have a system like Lovey's, no quarterback in the world can run that because it's just a not a perfection professional offense and you're seeing that josh mccown looks bad and he got hurt so it's it's not a good system and lovey's defense is finally getting exposed where there's so many glaring holes the tampa two has its place and it's always going to have a place in this league but you can't run it you can't run it to the degree lovey runs it there's so many gaping holes good offensive teams if they're if you can't get to the quarterback and if they've shown this time and time again, look why the Bears couldn't beat a lot of the high power teams with Lovey, is when you have if you can't get to the quarterback and you can't make pressure on him, you what you have is guys know where the soft spots are in that zone and they sit there and you get chunks of yards, chunks of yards, chunks of yards, and you move down the, the field. If you're not getting quarterback pressure, it's that's bad. That's you're you're getting exposed, and that's what happened yesterday or in that Thursday night game. So again, just talking about Lovey and the reason I'm I'm fine with him not being here anymore because we now have a professional offense that can put up some points. So let's the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about the uh, uh, what we have lined up for the Monday night game against the Jets. So I, I honestly feel this is going to be a very similar style matchup to what they had against the 49ers. Is the Jets have 
a really good run offense. They've got their three running backs deep that they can just keep hammering at you. They're the number one rushing team in the NFL. They're also the number one team against the run in the NFL. And that's that. So basically, they want to win this game in the trenches. If any of you watched the game, the Jets versus the uh, the Green Bay Packers, is that Green Bay they couldn't stop that offensive uh, you know presence of the Jets. And on defense, or when they were on offense, they couldn't run the ball at all. Every time they try, they would just get stood up. And finally, they started opening it up with the passing game because the Jets' weakness is their cornerbacks. And they're going to be without D. Milner, uh, one of their cornerbacks. So they're really susceptible in the defensive backfield to to some big plays. If the Bears, uh, the Bears can do what they did against the 49ers, I look for them to try to do a similar style of of offense that they ran in the second half where utilize the big bodies and make big plays down the field. And what I'm hearing is that the Jets are going to run a cover zero against the Bears where they're basically going to bring their safeties up and put a heavy pressure on Jay Cutler because they don't think that... I think they're fairly confident that they can't... they can't match up with Jay Cutler having time to throw and being able to stop the Bears' offense. And I think they know they can't do that because they saw they couldn't do it against Green Bay. And it's going to be a similar style where they just are the, you know, if they're unable to get pressure on Jay Cutler, it's going to be a long day for the Jets because the Bears are just going to put up points, put up points, put up points. Even if not being able to run the ball, they're just going to put up points. Just like the Packers did in the second half of that game where the Jets just didn't know what to do. It's, you know, it was they were unable to stop it. So I think their game plan is... Well, you know what? If we can't stop them, the passing game, we're going to stop Jay Cutler from throwing the ball, and they're going to bring a lot of pressure, and they're going to try to hit him and hit him hard. So the Bears' offense is uh, the offensive line better be on its toes because it's a it's a good Jets defensive set front seven, and they're going to bring guys and they're going to bring blitzes from all over the place and look for Jay Cutler to be uh, really heavily pressured. So hopefully the Bears can break some of that pressure with some slants and some other plays to to kind of keep the Jets on being honest and on their toes. That's what I look for for the Bears offense versus the Jets defense. Other way around is uh, they're going to hammer the run game because they know the Bears have a tough time stopping the run. So the Bears are going to have to really be able to stop that run and bring cheat up and bring a safety in the box if they need to. But guys are really going to have to, um, you know, hold their positions and and keep their responsibilities because otherwise this is going to be a long game if the Jets are able to to slash them on the round the ground game. And I think that's that's really what they're going to try to do is ground and pound and control the clock when the Jets have the ball on offense and pressure Jay Cutler when they're on defense. Um they may be without uh wide receiver Eric Decker. If so, uh, the I don't see them having too much passing success against the Bears, but uh, because um, their passing attack is not as sophisticated. They have a better running game by a little bit than the 49ers, but their passing game is not as good, is not as sophisticated, not as talented as the 49ers. Their quarterback's not as good as the Colin Kaeper- Kaepernick. Their wide receivers aren't as good as Crabtree and uh, Bolden. And so if... If the Bears are able to stop the run, the Jets, I think, are going to have some a tough time being able to score points. But that's a big if because the Jets' running game is really good. So that's this could be a really interesting game. It could be a, a route either direction because if, if they get pressure on Cutler and Cutler throws interceptions or fumbles the ball or they can't, they can't uh, get first downs, and the, the Jets are able to run the ball, this could be a route in the Jets' direction. If the Bears are able to cheat and bring a guy up in the eighth man in the box and be able to stop the run and, and really limit them to and no big plays on the running game, and they're able to ward off the pressure from the, uh, the Jets' uh, defensive front and, and leave their uh, wide receivers one-on-one against those cornerbacks with no safety help, that could be a blowout in the Bears' direction. 
but I think there's going to be a lot of in-game adjustments, and I think this is going to be a similar game to what we saw with the the Jets and the Packers, where it's going to the first half is going to be some feeling out uh, chances, and it's going to be a turnaround in the second half. I I see the Jets actually winning this one because I feel that uh, they're going to get they're either going to get to Cutler too many times and have him throw a bad pick on either a hit, you know, or or uh, rolling out and throwing back back across his body across the middle of the field like he did against Buffalo. I think it's going to be uh, the difference is going to be a bad interception by Cutler and that they return for a touchdown. So I think it's going to be a close game, but I think that's going to be the difference. So that's all we have for uh, this episode. Again, thanks to our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. Check out icehogs.com. First game uh, home at the BMO is Saturday, October 11th. Get tickets now. Uh, the Rockford Ice Hogs, it's, if you've never been there, is a fantastic time. The stadium is absolutely perfectly set up for, for minor league hockey, and it's a really good really good time I, I really enjoy going up there even though it's a little bit of a hike from chicago you'll well worth it uh, it's affordable enough to take your family whereas the, maybe the blackhawks uh might be out of the price range but the rockford ice hogs definitely affordable and definitely check us out at swirsky sports.com on twitter at, at swirsky sports facebook.com slash swirsky sports and make sure to uh to subscribe to the podcast feed and until next time, bear down. What a lucky break. The good Lord wants the Cubs to win. We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Oh, Cubs win. Cubs win. Cubs win. Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like the number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.